Welcome to another edition of RCE. I'm your host, Brock Palin, and I have again Jeff Squire from Cisco Systems and the OpenMPI Project. Jeff, once again, I hear you have a blog. <laughs> again, just like you were prompted to say that, yes, I, I do have a blog where I, I muse on M. And, and high performance networking kinds of things and would encourage everybody to go have a look at it because as it makes me look good among my Cisco fellow bloggers. <laughs> yes. And we have a link to that straight off of our front page at rce-cast.com where we have all of our old shows, an iTunes feed, an RSS feed, as well as you can download the MP3 directly from the site there for any old shows, as well as see who we've had, see who we plan on having, and also submit a nomination for any other topic you'd like to have on the show. Yeah, we might as well mention the whole social network working too. Um, Brock, you have a, a Twitter account there, and we accept questions for upcoming RCE podcasts from random people. So if there's something that you want to ask somebody on a, on a future interview, please uh, tweet that to, Br to Brock. Yep, my Twitter is Brock Palin, B-R-O-C-K-P-A-L-E-N, and that again is on the RCE website. So let's go ahead and get into our topic for today. Today we have two people from... Um, University of Tennessee at Knoxville. Uh, we have Jack Dungara and Jacob Kurzak, and they're both from the Plasma Project, and I'll let them explain what that is specifically, but I believe it's a lot of work for doing parallel linear algebra, but they can go into that specifically. Uh, sure, Brock. This is Jack Dungara. I'm a uh, professor here at the University of Tennessee uh, at Knoxville, and I'm in the Electrical Engineering and Computer Science Department. I also have a position at Oak Ridge uh, National Laboratory, and uh, occasionally uh, spend some time at the University of Manchester in England. Um, I'm interested in uh, high-performance computing, uh, designing uh, algorithms and software uh, for those uh, systems. I also have an interest in performance analysis and in, in uh, how affect uh, parallel uh, programs and applications. I've been here at the university for about uh, 20, uh, 20 years now. Uh, before that, I was um, a researcher at Argonne National Lab outside of Chicago. And, and I guess before that, I was a student uh, at the University of uh, New Mexico in the applied math uh, uh, program there. Uh, Jacob? Uh, this is Jacob Kurzak. I've been working with uh, Jack for four years now in the linear algebra group. Uh, software like, like uh, LAFAX, Telepod, and most recently uh, Plasma and Magma. Uh, before that, I did my PhD uh, at the University of Houston, uh, mostly doing uh, large-scale problems in uh, molecular design. Okay, so let's move right in. Uh, plasma, what is the motivation behind it, and what is it specifically first? Right, so PLASMA stands for uh, Parallel Linear Algebra Software for Multicore Architectures. And uh, here at the University of Tennessee, along with some colleagues um, at various places, Jim Dummel at Berkeley and, and colleagues really around the world, um, we have uh, been involved in the design and implementation of algorithms and software for linear algebra. And in my case, this goes back to um, really 1970, late, late 70s when we designed a package called LINPAC. So LINPAC was a package of linear algebra software for solving systems of linear equations. And when it came out, it was sort of revolutionary. It, it, it relied on um, a, a small package called the uh, basic linear algebra subprograms, the BLAS. And, and uh, at that time, there was only one level of the BLAS, namely vector operations. So LIMPAC was a, a beginning of, of uh, I'll call it a standardization process in linear algebra software. It quickly became apparent uh, with the advent of new machines, uh, different kinds of architectures, in particular, um, uh, not vector machines, but uh, shared memory uh, parallel uh, systems, which had cache as their uh, basic uh, operation mode for exploiting performance, that we had to redesign the algorithms. And that's uh, that's when we designed, Jim Demmel and I designed a package called LAPAC, Linear Algebra Package, and that was done, uh, actually, um, uh, it was done uh, in the in the 80s, in the, uh, in the late 80s, that package was, uh, was created. And 
uh, that was in use for, for many, many years. It contains uh, software for linear systems and equations and eigenvalue problems and um, uh, has enjoyed, again, widespread use, became a standard, is adopted by almost all the vendors and uh, commercial uh, software, numerical software companies. Um, but it became apparent with the advent of um, multi-core architectures that some changes were necessary in the fundamental design of that, uh, of that package. And that brought about, that brought about uh, Plasma. Uh, so Plasma was designed specifically for multi-core, initially for shared memory multi-core architectures, and the design basically uh, uh, took um, a step back and looked at the overall structure of the algorithms and tried to understand what the issues were uh, in terms of exploiting uh, multi-core uh, and trying to gain high performance in, in, in light of that. You know, it's clear that multi-core is more than just two, four, or eight cores. It's gonna go on uh, we would I guess uh, somewhere between uh, 100 cores we would see in the in the near future and potentially even greater numbers, perhaps up to a thousand cores uh, per socket uh, in the um, uh, in, in, in the foreseeable future. And we wanted to design a package that would take us through uh, tens to hundreds to thousands of cores on a socket, and uh, that's what uh, Plasma is attempting to do. So what's your main mode for that's different for extracting performance from many cores on a single linear algebra solve with Plasma versus something like LAPAC, uh, which you know, I, many people have used? Right. So LAPAC is based on you know, a very common technique for exploiting parallel processing. It's the, it's the fork join model. So you, you have a sequential thread. Uh, it comes to a point where it can fork off a number of things in parallel. Think of loops, uh, a loop being run in parallel, a number of independent processes being, uh, being spun off, and then um, waiting for all those processes. Um, so many of our algorithms can be structured in a very, uh, I'll call it, simple way to fit into that uh, this fork join kind of parallel process system. And uh, LAPAC is built around that, around that uh, in terms of uh, um, uh, splitting off the things and, uh, for operations that deal with the level. So uh, if you're going to be one of the level three blahs, which is engaged most often, is matrix multiply. So there's a sequentialized part of the code, and then we encounter a matrix multiply operation where we think about forking off a number of tasks to do, uh, to do that matrix multiply, and then we wait uh, until all those tasks are finished, and then we carry on the computation. So there's a fork join, bulk synchronous kind of operation that goes on, and that um, that was okay for a certain level of parallel processing. But with multi-core, uh, that breaks down. It breaks down very, very quickly. Of course, it works, uh, but the performance suffers. We see no, nowhere near the kind of performance that we would uh, uh, hope to see out of uh, out of the current generation and presumably next generation uh, multi-core architecture. So we want to break the fork join. Uh, parallelism, and uh, we've been doing that um, uh, and experimenting and looking at um, various ways uh, people have expressed parallel processing in, in the past, and um, uh, so today we're using a technique which is not a new technique, it's an old technique, but we're expressing the algorithm in terms of a directed acyclic graph. We're looking at uh, small uh, tiles of work, small blocks of computation that can be done and uh, unrolling basically the algorithm at a very high level to expose a lot of parallelism, to get a DAG which is very wide, which shows its, uh, uh, which shows its great depth in terms of the parallel and parallel processing. So at a very high level, our algorithms are expressed in terms of DAGs and we execute the DAG uh, on, on a multi-core architecture. So you break them up into tiles and so on. How how exactly do you map that to um, you know multi-core architectures? Are you actually doing things like examining cache sizes, examining shared caches, and examining the memory hierarchy as well? Or how do you assign that work? Well, um, so so there's a there there is a stage in the um, in the I'll call it deployment of the software, which looks at things like cache size uh, and tries to uh, quote auto tune. 
uh, the software to fit uh, optimally uh, with respect to the cache size. So there, there's a pre-processing step, let's call it, which does that. So we already know what the right cache size is, what the right tile size is. And now we're in a phase where we're generating work and um, you know, the, the, again, these are old ideas. Um, the work um, is gonna be uh, generated in the form of uh, dependencies. So um, uh, before a task can execute, its parents uh, have to complete. And uh, when, when the given task uh, is, is finished executing, it tells its children about the completion. And um, uh, so there is, uh, think, of a, uh, think of a DAG, uh, think of a node in a DAG being a computational uh, uh, component. Uh, that computational component uh, is dealing with uh, tiles of the matrix. Think of it as, as blocks of this matrix. And uh, each, each of these uh, work units has some parents and has some children. And before it can execute, before it can start, it waits for the parents to finish and give notification. And then uh, the, uh, the, the given task can be, uh, can be um, uh, put into a queue and told that it can, it can start its execution. Uh, Jacob, you wanna you wanna add to that? Um, so, uh, um, not really much to add. Uh, maybe emphasize the fact that uh, there is the, the auto tuning component is is uh, kind of an important part of that. Uh, so, um, so, so instead of uh, you know setting uh, uh, fixed sizes, uh, we would rather run it through uh, automatic machinery that uh, that. Um, makes a sweep through the parameter space and uh, finds the optimum. And let me, just, let me just make a comment here about what the user sees. Uh, the user doesn't see any of this. The user makes a call to a routine and something happens inside of the call where all the scheduling and dependencies and all the other things that we've just mentioned take place. So as far as the user is concerned, let's call it a naive user, he sees a, he sees a call to a Fortran or C routine uh, that gets uh, invoked in a conventional way, and then uh, something happens to uh, engage in uh, this uh, this parallel computation across uh, this multi-core uh, architecture. So that they magically get their answer faster, essentially. That's the goal: is that they magically get their answer uh, fast, uh, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna take it on ourselves to optimally uh, schedule things across that ensemble. Okay, now you, you were saying that these are old ideas and it, it sounds also uh, similar. I wonder if you could comment on, so uh, Apple just kind of popularized uh, these, these ideas too. Again, nothing new, but they just, uh, you know, debuted their whole Grand Central uh, kind of model in Snow Leopard. Is there any relation or do you have any uh, plans to utilize that on, on Apple machines or, or things like that? Well, um, so these topics are going to be very relevant, and, and we're going to see more and more things like this uh, coming out uh, in in the new in the near uh, future. And we've seen a lot of work already take place. So the idea of expressing algorithms in terms of DAGs that's an old idea. The idea of uh, executing or scheduling work uh, uh, based on dependencies that's an old idea. Um, you know, there are there are projects that have gone on in the past. Uh, there's a project at MIT called Silk, which used you know, similar kinds of ideas. There's a project at uh, Barcelona today, which is called uh, uh, SMPSS, which uses similar things. Uh, you know, there's, uh, we know about projects at Intel uh, for, doing, um, uh, for doing similar things called CT. Microsoft has, a, has an internal effort that they're looking at uh, similar things in terms of scheduling on multi-core. So there's a whole wave of things which are coming um, and, and as you point out, uh, Apple's uh, uh, Grand Central model is, is very similar at a, at a high level uh, for the scheduling of, uh, of parallel tasks. And um, you know, what we're trying to do is to come up with a model that fits within our, within our structure of numerical libraries. Uh, we want to use a standard, to be honest, but there's no standard today. There's no standard which is easily accessible by the community so we are in a mode where we're experimenting and implementing something, and as soon as a standard becomes available, we would target it to that. Um, you, you remember MPI, in the old days, this is exactly what we did. That is, we developed a process, we developed some software called MPI, sorry, PVM, and that was a message passing library. It was something that we put together here in Tennessee uh, with, uh, with a colleague uh, from Emory, and uh, that became a message passing environment and then when the community was ready to uh, develop a standard, 
uh, you know, we 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 uh, we embraced that standard uh, for our software and contributed to those ideas, of course. And and then uh, we we use that standard from that point. So this is a time when in the community where experimentation is taking place. And when that standard is ready, we would uh, we would fit within that standard and utilize it for doing the scheduling. I had the benefit of actually seeing you speak at SC a couple of years ago at a Microsoft lunch where I was introduced to Plasma. This is how I first found out about it. And while we're doing audio here, if you go to the Plasma website, there's a presentation where it shows how you pack together these tiles as a scheduling across multiple cores and how much more dense it is compared to the current lay pack with a threaded blast underneath model. The impression I had is because of your tiles, you're kind of pulling the parallelism to a higher level. It's much more, the linear algebra portion is much more aware of that it's running in parallel and it's running these tiles. Is that correct? Yeah, I think that's, that's a reasonable characterization. That is, if you take a look at a timing profile of the algorithm in terms of parallel blocks and how they fit together, and how the uh, how we're effectively utilizing the underlying hardware. We get a very dense um, uh, structure, and by dense I mean there's very little idle time of those of those uh, processes. Um, uh, and as a result, uh, things run much faster than the conventional way of doing the fork join kind of uh, fork joint fork join kind of uh, parallelism. So that's what we're that's what we're after, and we want to do that. Um, uh, initially, we're doing this for shared memory systems. So today, all of our software that's released runs on a, a shared memory environment. We're, we're now experimenting and designing the distributed uh, implementation of those ideas and concepts so that we could uh, do uh, what's called message passing and uh, have uh, the scheduling go on and have this uh, DAG representation uh, execution take place. Uh, on this uh, uh, coordinated, uh, parallel, distributed uh, system. Okay, so that'd be like a successor to Scala Pack, or are you targeting different things? Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. So Scala Pack is the counter uh, counter project to LA Pack. LA Pack is for shared memory. Scala Pack is for distributed memory. And uh, today, Plasma works with shared memory, and will eventually do distributed memory. I don't know that we would call it something different internally. We call it Plasma D, but um, you know that's just a, a code that we have here. And you know we have nothing to release in terms of the distributed version. We're still experimenting. Uh, we have some software for Plasma, of course, and um, uh, you know that software that we're happy to uh, let people use, experiment with, and quote support. Um, uh, but eventually, uh, it would move to a different, uh, this different environment. And, and let me just mention that um, uh, you know w one of the things in the computational science area, which is uh, very important today and is going to have more importance in the future, is uh, accelerators. Um, and our accelerators today are GPUs. Uh, so we're designing a package around uh, that uh, that concept as well. That's a project we have called Magma. Uh, so MAGMA is an effort to uh, look at uh, matrix algebra for GPU and multi-core architectures. That's what MAGMA stands for. And um, uh, the idea is we have a hybrid system now, and uh, we want to exploit, again, the same kind of concepts, the egg-based approach uh, to executing across this uh, uh, hybrid um, uh, architecture. Uh, and uh, exploiting both the, the multi-core and the accelerator or the GPU as, uh, as effectively as possible. Jack, it's almost like you know exactly what our questions are going to be before we even ask them. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it's amazing, yes, the psychic power that we have. <laughs> so even though Plasma D is not released at this time, um, you can use the current Plasma in a hybrid MPI shared memory parallelism kind of application right now. There's there's nothing stopping that. Uh, well, uh, okay, but let, let me be very clear. Uh, Plasma that's released today does no message passing. So uh, you could use it, um, but you would have to then fit something on top of it to uh, to do um, uh, message passing between the, uh, between the nodes in your parallel system. Um, but, but Plasma just works on a multi-core uh, configuration. And by that, that I mean... That uh, a shared memory node so that we have multiple sockets uh, on a node sharing memory. Plasma works fine in that arrangement. Is there any benefit um, to using Plasma in a serial in a serial case where you only have one core dedicated to the 
whatever spawning plasma over existing laypack. Well, I'll let Jacob answer that. He's had a little bit more experience in that situation. Um, I think there there might be. We rarely uh, we rarely run plasma on a single core. Uh, I would say that uh, probably uh, LA Park uh, with uh, really good vendor glass underneath, like MKL, is probably going to run a single core a little faster on larger problems. And probably plasma is going to run a little faster on smaller problems, smaller matrix sizes. So a follow-up question on that. Intel is talking, uh, you know, they're talking all kinds of good stuff about the whole Nehalem line and whatnot. And they're really trying to hype the fact that hardware threads should come back in vogue, even, even for HPC. Or at least some class of HPC applications will actually benefit from their hardware threads. So we've been talking throughout this conversation about cores. Have you guys a- experimented with hardware threads, particularly on some of these newer Intel or even AMD-based hardware threading architectures? So uh, so far, unfortunately, for uh, for dense linear algebra, it's it's the same old story that uh, hyper threading really kills the performance. And that, that's the short answer. Uh, unless the model of hyper-threading changes, uh, then there's really, there's really no performance benefits. There's a huge performance drop if you try uh, running something uh, that's compute-intensive uh, using hyper-threading. Uh, it gives benefits for, uh, for, memory, uh, for memory-intensive codes, uh, but um, so far it really annihilates performance for compute-intensive codes. What's what's the problem? What is it that uh, kills the performance? Uh, so uh, there is no performance benefit, first of all, because uh, you, you, they don't really multiply uh, your FPU, your floating point units. So uh, so you don't get any advantage. And on top of that, uh, you get uh, context switches, uh, which you know, no matter how optimized they are in hardware, they uh, they introduce an overhead, and, uh, and they probably also uh, mess up uh, the memory accesses and the cache systems. If you're talking about cache and the f- different multiple floating point units, what do you see the biggest downside is right now with these CPUs we're getting and the current design of the memory structure for actually accessing data and memory? I don't really see any any major flaws uh, in the way that the caches are designed. I have a feeling that compute intensive codes like like our codes are uh, are probably happier with uh, with dedicated caches instead of shared caches. Uh, but uh, plasma can exploit the cache hierarchy quite well, uh, so it's not a big concern for compute intensive codes. Uh, we're happy with with the current line of Intel processors. So right now you're happy with the performance as long as things are based in cache. So if a, if a user is writing a code from scratch and not using something like Plasma for the algorithm, if they're not effectively um, using cache and relying more on main memory, um, how, how do you see performance going currently then with the current systems? Oh, uh, you absolutely have to use some kind of optimized software for this kind of problems. Uh, there is absolutely no way that uh, any kind of naive code can get any decent performance. Uh, uh, you have to use uh, algorithms like like Plasma style algorithms, and underneath you really need a good implementation of BLAS, not only because uh, you want to utilize your caches, but also another fact, another important factor is uh, these days, uh, you know, Intel lines of processors and AMD and others uh, rely heavily on uh, vector extensions for performance, uh, like SSC. Uh, so, if you really want to get your performance from your compute-intensive uh, code, uh, you really have to use good implementation of BLAS that uh, does the right things in terms of cache blocking and uses the vector, the SIMD vector extensions like SSC. So if you're trying to write naive code from scratch, you know, numerical recipes kind of code, you're totally toast. Yeah, that was actually a uh, loaded question. Uh, this is something I harp to all of my users all the time. So I wanted somebody who has more clout than me to point that out to people. 
So a couple other questions then. So you're planning on having an MPI version soon. Um, do you plan on doing a mixed model where there will be spawning threads on the multi-core systems with MPI between them? Or do you actually want to distribute these tiles over MPI to serial processes, um, each being a unique MPI rank? I think that um, the MPI model uh, stays the same as, as it is right now. So, so I, I imagine it as a hierarchical model where at the MPI level, uh, it's sort of business as usual. And, and then uh, we step in and do uh, smarter things within the node. Uh, and you know, do things like, uh, like multi-core and DAX scheduling and also uh, utilize uh, accelerators. And uh, you know, the MPI uh, version is, is at some level also uh, using the DAX scheduling model uh, but nevertheless, it's, it's more of a hierarchy. It's more of a two-level approach than a flat-level approach. So extending that a little bit, I want to circle around to the accelerators bit here. Do you see accelerators then adding a third level to it? Or would, uh, would you use accelerators in lieu of the main processor? I guess I'm, what I'm asking is, you know, where, where do you guys see it going in, in, in Magma, and, and how is the whole accelerator model working out? Right. So uh, today, um, you know, uh, accelerators um, are connected over a very slow link to the um, to the main processor uh, for a PC uh, Express uh, connection, and you know that limits uh, what we can do or what we can extract from it um, and how we operate. But you know, it's clear to me that in the future, uh, the accelerators are going to be part of the socket uh, in terms of. Uh, what we see on the chip itself. So we'll have, we'll have a different, we'll have a, we'll have a combination of uh, conventional cores and accelerator cores on the socket itself. And then we'll have very fast communication between them, much faster than we have uh, today. Uh, it, it'll be sort of like, um, uh, you know, today we actually have a similar situation. Jacob just mentioned the SSE functions on the uh, x86 architecture. Those are embedded in the chip, and uh, we get it. We extract performance because we use that accelerated part of the chip, which was there to do graphics. In a similar way, in the future, we would see uh, architectures being designed, which are multi-core, having certain cores devoted to conventional kinds of uh, instruction sets, and then other cores being uh, devoted to uh, more uh, computationally intensive things, more. Uh, uh, numerical or more graphical in, in nature. And uh, we want to be able to exploit that in, in some way. And um, that's, that's really where this magma hybrid architecture uh, ideas are going is towards that, uh, towards that direction and, and trying to exploit as much as possible of both sides of that architecture uh, using not just one, but both sides, that is trying to uh, assign work to the multi-core as well as to the accelerator part and do it in an intelligent way so they're both kept busy for roughly the same amount of time. Again, if we think about that um, computational graph, uh, trying to assign work to compress as much as possible uh, any of the idle time out of that, uh, out of that uh, scenario. So uh, let me ask the other direction then. So I asked a second ago about extending downward into accelerators, and you're saying that they're going to be brought up into the, the, you know, the main architecture itself. What about the other direction for networks? Um, networks get completely, uh, well, they, they throw in a whole new range of variables uh, with latency and jitter and with contention and all kinds of things like that. Do you see similar efforts there um, in that networks will become closer to processors or will it just be addressed by you know scaling out the multi-core side of things? What, what's your vision on that? Well, I, I would see the networks getting faster as well. The network, the bandwidth and latency improving. So latency going down, the bandwidth going up, uh, but it'll be still a great separation between what happens on the socket itself or on the node itself. So we still have to face multiple levels in the hierarchy um, uh, where everything is improving, uh, hopefully at some rate that, that makes sense uh, so that we can, we can exploit things, but there will be a difference. So we will still have to use um, a distributed model in terms of our computation. I would say that we're going to have the same programming model for the next five years. That is a programming model where 
Uh, we do something uh, locally in a shared uh, context, maybe using something like uh, uh, open MP or some threaded model for exploiting the, the, the parallelism, and then a MPI basis uh, going further uh, further afield in terms of uh, the, the distributed or non-uniform nature of the uh, memory hierarchy. And uh, you know what happens five years beyond today, I, I really can't predict. You know, people talk about um, uh, you know, PGAS languages and, and things of that nature, which uh, you know, which are very interesting, and uh, we would uh, we would look forward to uh, to engaging in that. But you know, to have the whole community switch and to change overnight, I don't think that's going to happen. So for the next five years, I would forecast um, you know, still being MPI, still using uh, some mechanism for exploiting uh, shared memory parallelism. Uh, uh, at a level of using threads or or some uh, some other thing like OpenMP. So in a talk you had given that I had seen, you talked about using mixed precision in some of these kernels where part of the algorithm is not mathematically sensitive to actually require double precision and using single precision. Is this something you're still looking at doing? I, I played with the current plasma and it didn't look like it supported that. Well, oh, yeah. So the current version does actually support it. We, yes, we are we are doing this, and and the motivation comes about because of a difference between 32-bit and 64-bit floating point arithmetic. Even on conventional architectures, x86 based, um, there's a factor of two. Uh, so you know, if you did a computation in 64-bit uh, and then looked at the comparison between 32-bit, the floating point unit is running twice as fast in single precision 32-bit arithmetic and because you're transferring less data, 32 bits instead of 64 bits of data for each data item, you gain in terms of memory bandwidth and cache utilization. So you're getting a boost in terms of performance there on conventional systems. We were originally motivated to look at this because of the IBM cell processor, where between single and double precision for the original cell uh, cell chips, the chips that are in the PlayStation 3, for example, that was a factor of, uh, I think it's 10, between the single and double precision. So there's an order of magnitude improvement that you can exploit. And there are some algorithms that you can put together which uh, can benefit from that. So in linear algebra, there's a well-known algorithm called iterative refinement, where you factor the matrix in, uh, uh, and then you refine the solution that you get out of a factored matrix. So we've extended that to factor the matrix in 32-bit arithmetic and then do the refinement step in 64-bit arithmetic. And uh, the factorization part uh, that's done in 32-bit arithmetic is order n cubed, and the refinement part is order n squared. So you get a big boost in performance. And we've used that on um, conventional processors. Uh, we implemented that in LAPAC. We implemented it in, in Plasma. We implemented it in Magma where we're using GPUs. Today's NVIDIA, the current release, the Tesla chip, uh, Tesla board is, uh, I think it's a factor of eight between single and double precision uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the execution rates. And we see uh, you know, a big boost in performance when you use an algorithm which exploits both single and double precision. I think there's a lot of promise for these algorithms in the future, um, uh, even if it's only a factor of two that you're gaining. But you know, when we see uh, things like the accelerators getting eight or a factor of eight or 10, by using these things, it really becomes a big bonus. So did uh, Brock not notice that this was happening because this is part of the magic that just happens underneath the covers and it's not something that you actually even need to advertise? It's just, it's the magic. This is why it goes fast. Uh, actually, no, it, it, it's, not, it's not just part of the auto magic uh, nature. You have to call a certain routine. And, and I'm not sure if Brock, when Brock looked at Plasma, it hasn't always been in Plasma. So. Uh, I know it's in the current release, which is version 2.1.1.0, and it, it's, um, uh, it may not have been in a, a, a former uh, version of Plasma. But today's version of Plasma has uh, you know, systems linear equations, least squares problems, multiple precision, uh, mixed precision. It, has, uh, it uses an implementation of static uh, scheduling. Uh, it, it, it has interfaces which look a lot like LAPAC. It does a thread-safe model. Of, of its threading, and it runs on uh, Windows, Linux, um, uh, AAIX, on, on the Mac systems uh, in, in general. So the version that we have today is, uh, is a uh, pretty fully functional, uh, small numerical library, which we're building out. So it's going to be built out in a way which would um, hopefully uh, uh, encompass what we're doing in LAPAC, 
and then beyond that, of course. So in terms of the maturity of plasma, can it be used as a drop-in replacement for LA Pack, or it doesn't quite have everything that LA Pack has right now? So today the functionality is not uh, not complete coverage. It has a number of uh, routines, uh, which are the most used routines, let me say, the most used path within uh, LA Pack. And um, uh, you know, Plasma will eventually uh, provide uh, coverage for uh, all of uh, what we're doing today in LA Pack. Uh, and uh, hopefully can go beyond that and uh, and, and take on more of the uh, uh, functionality that's in linear algebra uh, and and do it in a way that effectively exploits multi-core and do it in a way that effectively exploits uh, accelerator-based things as well. So let's get a little bit of information on what's the license uh, Plasma's under, so basically who can use it and where's the location we can download it from and build it? Right, so um, as far as the license goes, it's a modified BSD uh, license. Um, it's, the, it's a license which has three, uh, three clauses or three statements. Uh, it goes by the name Standard BSD, I think, today. Uh, so it, it's freely available. It's, uh, you can embed it within commercial packages. Um, uh, you know, we're happy to have you use it. Um, uh, you can download it from uh, our, uh, our, co our repository, which is held at www.netlib.org slash plasma. And if you go there, you'll see our uh, software. Uh, the other package, Magma, is there as well. So www.netlib.org slash magma, and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see that package there. Again, they're completely open and freely available. Um, uh, we, uh, we invite people to use them, and we welcome feedback on, those, uh, on that software documentation. And we're happy to provide uh, you know, the, all the support we can. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jack and Jacob, for your time today, and probably have you guys on for some other stuff in the future. But the show will be up this weekend, and we'll talk to you guys later. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks for you. having us.